I cannot fathom how Ipswich fans do it. The goals, they're just always going to come. You can never say never in the Championship. He knows what it takes to get out of this division. This final run-in is arguably the toughest that any team will ever have. I think that was massively disrespectful. Because I think Leeds are going to win the title. Will they hit 100? I'd be surprised if they don't. Hello guys, welcome back to the Sportsman Untitled and we've got another championship special for you. We're going to talk about our team of the season so far, who's in contention for the promotion spots and who is going to get relegated in an incredible relegation battle. I'm joined today by resident Birmingham City fan Connor Keane. Connor, how are you getting on? Yeah, I've been better. Let's just, <laughs> let's just say that. And Justin Peach, Justin, how are you doing? Yeah, not bad, not bad, not bad. Derby. Doing me the very best to uh, bring me down, but not bad. So we'll cover everything you want to know about the championship in this episode. Let's get into it. I'm going to start off with my hot take from a few weeks ago. Justin, you were here in this room and I said, Leicester will not win the league. I think it was before they played Leeds. I think they had about a nine point advantage at that time. Yeah. Should we throw the clip in just to make sure I'm not making this up? Leicester don't win the championship. Wow. There we go. That's, That's how we'll one. Big one. I know. So I said they won't win the league. They've now dropped down to second. Obviously, they still have a game in hand. What's gone wrong there and how are you feeling about them now? I'm a little bit nervous about Leicester. I think Maresca's ability to be a little bit stubborn with his side of play, very pep, if you like. His ability to be a bit stubborn with his side of play maybe is, is, is possibly allowing teams to catch up with them and teams to really work them out. You know, If you play deep behind Leicester, let them play in front of you, um, they will struggle to, to, to break you down. Um, and, and we've seen that. And we've also seen like the absence of Wilfred and Didi as well over the last sort of two months, really, has really, really impacted things. But I think in terms of Moresco and Leicester going on to win the title, yes, I am nervous. It's mainly down to Ipswich and Leeds' relentlessness and whether Leicester can flip the switch and, and go again because it's a really difficult thing to do but we're going into this mini season now it's the business end isn't it it's the, the mini season um, where yeah the promotion candidates become promotion you know bona fide promotion contenders and yeah it's, it's a really big really big uh, really big challenge for them and Connor how are you feeling about Leicester it must be hard if you've had such a lead it looked like they were going to cruise to the title at one point now they've kind of slipped away can they go again because they have that game in hand if they win all their games they will win the league yeah, I, I, th I think so. I think, like, you know, we've obviously seen them from them over the season. Like, they do have the quality and they do have, you know, the players there to basically overcome this recent setback. Obviously, they lost three in a row. Then they bounced back with a win and a draw, which, you know, is like, oh, OK, like, you know, they're, they're starting to, you know, get back down and figure things out. But, you know, as, as Justin touched on then, you know, it's like Maresca's, you know, has it been like a bit of stubbornness and held, and from the players' point of view, was that little, like, setback? Was that a touch of complacency and that they just thought we probably are you know guaranteed to go up at this point I mean they're still they're still in a great position obviously the game in hand is huge but obviously if they were to slip up again you know the likes of Ipswich and Leeds are going to be there to pounce and we've got to talk about the grey cloud that's hanging over them now in this financial um, potential points deduction if they do get promoted into the Premier League next year. What do you think this means for kind of Leicester's mid-term future, if you like? I mean, it adds a certain layer of pressure, doesn't it, that Moreski's not really had to contend with as a, as a manager. I mean, he's relatively inexperienced anyway compared to the likes of Daniel Fark and maybe even Kieran McKenna as a as a first-team manager. So he's got to deal with that pressure as well. Um, and there'll be pressure from upstairs because if, you know, if Leicester don't go up, they're going to be impacted next season in Championship. They're going to have to sell players. They're going to have to contend with a potential points deduction. There's a lot of things swimming around for Leicester. But I think at the moment, it's just a case of right, get promoted and, and deal with it as it, as it comes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big blow for them because, as I say, it adds a layer of pressure where they don't need it. They've, they've already had a setback in terms of form. Dip, performances have dipped. Is this going to impact performances potentially? It's just yeah, an uncomfortable scenario to be put in at this point in the season. If they drop into the playoffs, we could see some of the most high-pressure playoff <laughs> games. Yeah, they lose, yeah. they could be completely out of it. You touched on him there, Daniel Fark. He could be on to win his third championship title in his last three seasons at this level. Connor, where does he rank for you in terms of championship managers? For what he did at Norwich and now he's doing it at Leeds as well? He's, he's certainly up there. Like You can't argue with, with his record Like at this level. It's absolutely exceptional. You know... The way, the way, obviously, like, you know, Leeds, they didn't have the fact, like, you know, unlike Leicester, they weren't quick out of the traps. But obviously, you know, as the more time progressed, he was able to implement his style on the team. And now, like, they're playing some of the better football, you know, arguably over Leicester at the moment. Um, probably up against Ipswich and Southampton as well. It's just, yeah, there's not really much more that could be said that he's just a very good manager. And obviously, you know, if he does get Leeds promoted this year, you know, I think a lot of neutrals want to see him overcome the Premier League hurdle. And Justin, do you agree with that in terms of 
seeing him next season, hopefully as a Premier League manager, Norwich haven't really been set up to compete at that level, whereas it feels like Leeds will be more able to give him the tools you know, he deserves to have a go at the Premier League. It certainly gives you a lot more of a resource to scrutinise him by. Because as I say, Norwich was essentially, the recruitment was a bit, well, it wasn't enough for a Premier League side. Um, they spent money where they didn't really need to spend money. And as you say, Leeds have got the pulling power to attract a higher calibre of player, which is great. Um, and for Daniel Farker, it probably gives him a lot more potential to get out of that team. And of, of course, obviously, if, if none of the uh, clubs that are, or the loanies went out to in the summer take up their permanent options on them, got a whole host of players coming back and there's you know, more quality to work with there. But I think his ability to work with the squad that he's got, he probably knows his squad better than Maresca knows his Leicester squad and Mark Russell Martin knows his Southampton squad. And I think that sort of that aspect of it, I think, works well. I mean, you only want to look at Ethan Ampadu dropping in the centre half and Leeds becoming an absolute defensive monster over the past sort of seven or eight weeks. That's how well he knows his squad. So I think that would stand him in good stead going into the Premier League. Mm, from the defensive monsters to the attacking monsters of the Championship, Ipswich Town, 80 goals. They've scored now the most in the division. Eight games to go. Justin, do we think they can get to the 100-goal mark? And if they do, they might be a Premier League team next season. It's incredible, really. I, I cannot fathom how Ipswich fans do it on a week-by-week -week basis. <laughs> Just that level of stress. I saw a, a, a picture on Twitter of some guy's heart rate at about 167 beats per minute, which is like borderline, you know, it's dangerous <laughs> um, but that's what football clubs do to you and Ipswich's ability to, to keep going and just be relentless in games is, is, is magnificent their game management okay defensively can be questioned but the ability to just keep attacking is just second to none so will they hit 100 I'd be surprised if they don't because Keith Moore's come in scoring goals he's added another dimension to their attacks I think he's a little bit more clinical than George Hurst was um, Omar Hutchison's become a machine as well uh, yeah, that performance against Sheffield Wednesday was probably one of the most complete performances of a player this season it was magnificent so when you've got players coming into form like that it's hard to see them not hitting that 100 goal barrier and if, that, if they do that then my god yeah they've got to be in the top two It felt like they suffered a bit of a dip in January where they tried to work out how to cope without a few key players and then they went into the market and those signings seemed to have paid off is it the fact that McKenna's got so many options that makes Ipswich so dangerous yeah I mean the, the point I make is like they are stacked it's like you know even if the players aren't starting you have like obviously al is obviously coming had an impact as well off the bench. Marcus Harness, who you know has really come into his own as part of this squad in the championship this year, you know it doesn't matter who who basically plays and who doesn't. Like there is so much quality at Ipswich that you know the goals they're just always going to come. And we'll move on to Southampton. It feels like they've dropped out of this top two conversation, perhaps prematurely, given they've got two games in hand on the likes of Ipswich and one game in hand on Leeds. I think they've still got to play a couple of those top teams as well as we approach this last run-in. Russell Martin, for you at Southampton, have they still got a chance at the top two? Or are you seeing it more as a, a three-horse race? I'm seeing it more as a three-horse race, but as you say, you can't really count them out. It's Southampton Leeds on the final day of the season, for example. So if it comes down to that, then we're all in for a treat, aren't we? But I think with with that, um, I think it comes down to you know, Russell Martin on his side, as well as the likes of Daniel Farker and Kieran McKenna. I think Maresk is quite fortunate in the quality that he's got, and that's carried them through quite a few games. But Farker and McKenna at Ipswich, and uh, at Leeds and Ipswich, I think it's the way they know the squads, the way their form is going. It's really hard to see Southampton. Uh, well, it's really hard to see them dropping off, and therefore Southampton, you know, catching them up. But I say you can never say never in the Championship. You're only two two games away from from catching up the, the, the sides in the top two. Uh, well, that is the case at the moment. So with the quality that Martin's got, they can win games. But as I say, it's really hard to see the likes of Leeds and Ipswich dropping points at this point. And Connor, which camp would you feel most comfortable in at this moment in time? In terms of managers as well, how much does that experience of being in a promotion race factor into that in terms of we've seen McKenna win promotion last season, we've seen Daniel Fart do it twice already at this level. Mm -hmm. It feels like Martin and Maresca don't have that experience. So which camp would you rather be in and would it be under one of the experienced managers? Yeah, it has to be Fart because obviously he knows what it takes to get out of this division and obviously like this final run-in is arguably the toughest that any team will ever have like in in a promotion race like obviously it's it's normally difficult every year but obviously when you've got so many good teams fighting for those like two automatic spots this year makes it that tough and obviously it's like it's fine margins that separate you and obviously Farker with that extra little bit of experience you think yeah that is what can get you over the line and obviously as a Leeds fan you're thinking that's exactly what we want to hear and it's, we want to see. It's exactly why they hired him and so do you think Leeds are going to secure the title and who's going to go up with them? I, at this moment in time I would be leaning towards them for the title just purely because of the Farker effect um, and in terms of who goes up with them oh, it's 
it is hard. Obviously, we have we have talked about like Leicester's drop in form and obviously Ipswich's ability to score goals. It's definitely going to be one of those two, I think. Um, but I think right now I would probably lean towards Ipswich slightly. Okay, you got off the fence. We'll accept. Uh, yeah, we'll accept I will that. lean. I will lean towards. Justin, are you firmly on the fence, or have you? Uh... No, I, I've <laughs> sort of. I've been humming and for a couple of weeks. Whether it's going to be Ipswich or Leicester, because I think Leeds are going to win the title. Because you said that that Farker factor, that experience of winning the title, is Norwich seems being relentless in the second half of the seasons. Each in, in each of his title winning campaigns, there hard to see them dropping off now, especially with the quality that they've got compared to the likes of. Leicester and Ipswich, even you know the depth compared to Leicester, and then overall quality compared to Ipswich. But with um, with Ipswich, I, th- I think it's just that uncertainty defensively. Like, they do make mistakes. They they do. Um, they have a habit of doing it, and that's that's one of the things that's always made me question them whether or not they can finish in the automatics because that can be the big difference between uh, the top two and, uh, and a place in the playoffs. So for me, I think Leicester with that game in hand might just edge it. But I'm not 100 percent convinced on Maresca either in terms of turning around that form so I'm going to edge slightly towards Leicester but it's a tentative uh, I don't know it's going to be such <laughs> a good end to the season for yeah. those three I can't remember a, a, obviously the, the quality of the championship at the top of the season is better than ever mm. and I think we're going to get such an exciting finish another team who's going to have an exciting finish to the season is my team Coventry FA Cup semi finalists. can't believe we're saying this <laughs> um, let's start with you Connor do you think Mark Robbins has done one of the best jobs in the EFL over the last decade? Seven years now he's celebrated at Coventry. Well, obviously, having worked with me for a couple of years now, Simon, you know that I'm a big Mark Robbins fan. And I've, <laughs> I always say to him, I said, I don't know how someone has never come in for him, like, you know, with like bigger resources. Obviously, Coventry, you know, your situation has changed, obviously, in the last couple of years. But even still, it's like the work he has done. It's like it has been rated, but at the same time, it still has been massively underappreciated just what he has done. And yeah, I think in the last decade, you, you won't find anyone who's done a, a far greater job, especially because in this day and age, you don't get managers stay as long as a club that he has with Coventry. And the FA Cup semi final, the way it unfolded against Wolves in the quarter final, it feels like it's only now really that he's getting the attention he deserves, Justin. Yeah, it's, it's quite astonishing, really, because as I say, you, quite, you know, Robbins is taking Coventry from. Uh, League Two into the Championship he's turned him into FA Cup semi-finalist they were a, a kick away from the Premier League last season it's quite astonishing that he's not had the plaudits that he deserves other than from people who do follow the Championship outside the Championship it's been quite quiet and it's yeah it's quite quite an interesting one I think certain managers are better at sort of being builders you know like Nathan Jones at Luton you know he struggled at Stoke and Southampton but he's gone down to Charlton and probably try and replicate the job he did at Luton Mark Robbins probably fits that category but then again if I was a a, you know, a lower league Premier League type team I would you know, go for Mark Robbins so the job that he's done at Coventry certainly deserves at least the, uh, the 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 speculation at the very least I mean he won't be bothered will he because he's Mark Robbins but um, you know he's, he's one of those managers that does deserve a lot more plaudits than he's, than he's had because as I say the job he's done is just astonishing really and the, the, the problems he's had to put up with as well not many clubs have had to go through mm-hmm. that I think that's the main part of it I don't think people realise obviously we were on our way down to League 2 when he came in but the club was an absolute mess. We had yeah. a shed as a training ground. We were about to leave, you know, our, our city for the second time in a couple of years. The players were all on loan or free, and it was like the club. If if he didn't come in, I think we would have to question the existence of our football club right yeah. now. And he came in and changed everything. And where we are now, unbelievable. We're going to move on to another hypothetical question for you next, which is. There's a lot of talk about reaching the Premier League and the finances it brings. But would you rather your EFL club, so Derby for you, Justin, Birmingham for you, Connor, reach the FA Cup final with a big win, say, over a Manchester United in a semi-final, or got promoted to the Premier League? Where do you stand on this one? Uh, it's For me, it's definitely like the, the cup, because, I mean, from personal experience, obviously I was there when we lifted the League Cup um, in 2011 at Wembley. And obviously, we then followed that with relegation. Obviously, all the all the talk was like, you know, I mean, talk's bought massively guilty for stuff like this. It's like, would you rather like win a cup and uh, you know go down, or have lost the cup and you know stayed up? And you know, what is the point of football? It's about having you know winning, like being able to win things and you know stuff to stuff to show off. You know, yeah, you could have a decent couple of years in the Premier League, but you know, it doesn't go in the trophy cabinet, so. Yeah, I think like 
for, for you obviously now having this experience it's just thinking yeah that's just something i could only dream of right now i also get the point of where everyone's like oh it's you know financial security 200 million but i'm not an accountant i'm a football fan <laughs> i want to see you know my team in these big moments yeah. against these big teams so i'm on your side connor justin yeah it's, i think for me i think one of my last came when we talked about fan apathy with the premier league clubs i sort of doing nothing sat in, sat in mid table just doing nothing and are you competing or you're not sort of thing and I think for me it's all about the I think most football fans it's all about the journey rather than the destination so I think getting to a cup final would mean more to me than getting to the Premier League I mean I've followed Derby to the Premier League it wasn't fun um, <laughs> how did you get on by the way well, yeah, let's say the better, let's say the better. I mean even playoff campaigns yeah, I've seen more defeats at Wembley than I've seen wins so it's, it's not it's not a nice experience to, to go through but it's all about moments as a fan and I think getting to a cup final gives you those moments I mean getting promoted gives you those moments as well but the chances of that happening repeatedly or more often than getting to a cup final I've not seen Derby get to a cup final in my lifetime you know I've kind of been looking at getting you know seeing Birmingham get to a league cup final so it's just it doesn't happen very often and you know, you've got to savour those moments because as I say it takes generations for them to come and I'll get a quick opinion from both of you on this one do Coventry have a chance against Man United? Because I'm getting a little bit excited, so I'll let the neutrals take this one. So I'm just going to say, like, I'm not even a Coventry fan, and I've kind of been annoyed at some of the the reaction to the semi-final draw. So obviously, Carrag yeah. Carragher was very bitter about obviously losing to Manchester United, and I can't remember if it was directly to Gary Neville that he replied, but he was basically like, "Oh, you'll lose to City in the final anyway." I think that was massively disrespectful. It's like Coventry have earned their right to be in the semi-final. And obviously, you know, Manchester United are still very unpredictable. Yes, they did very well against Liverpool. But obviously, Liverpool were like also not at their best and they haven't been great, really, in the last couple of weeks. But Coventry, they've fully earned their right to be there and they have more than a chance against this Manchester United team. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Uh, Coventry have got match winners. I mean, had you right, people would look at him and go, he's a championship striker, but he you know, recently scored, well, he scored in the international break for the US against uh, Jamaica in the, the CONCACAF uh, semi-final, uh, Nations, League, Nations League semi-final. So he is, a, he is a big match winning kind of player and Coventry have those kind of hair, has got the quality. Ben Chief, if he's fit, is, a, is, is an incredible player at championship level and deserves his chance in the Premier League. There's, it's a team packed full of Premier League talent and you can't rule them out, especially in a cup game it's the typical it's a, it's a cup game it's a one-off um, and I think Coventry have got the ability to, to basically do Man United because Man United as Connor was saying they, they fluctuate they, they, you know, they get complacent so for me Coventry do easily You've not helped quell my excitement for a game that's <laughs> almost a month away we'll talk about the playoff places now it feels like only sixth places up for grabs if we're honest Southampton and West Brom looking very very good in fourth and fifth so we've got Norwich Hull Coventry and Preston kind of competing for that uh, sixth place. Justin, let's start with you. How do you judge each of those teams at the minute and which one's got your fancy to finish sixth as we head into the running? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with Coventry. I think Coventry is probably the easiest one because obviously coming, coming straight off the back of the, the Cup semi-final chat. And I don't think, I don't buy into the cliche that the Cup semi-final is a distraction. Um, but I think it's more so that Coventry are one of the teams that have used the least players this season. They've used 23 players. And it's a joint least in the division alongside Watford and um, I can't remember the other side, but They've only used 23 players. They've got a small squad. It's not necessarily the cup final is going to be a distraction. It's more so the fact that they've got to play games in hand between now and the end of the season, which is only a matter of weeks away. It's a lot of games to get into a short space of time. So, you know, has, have they got the depth to do it? Maybe, maybe not. For me, that's what I, um, gives Norwich the edge over Coventry. Because I think it's those two sides that are probably in the driving seat. Um, Norwich's attack of Josh Sargent, Gabriel Sara, Boy Signs, Johnny Rowe, if he's back fit from his hamstring injury. They're players who can carry teams over the line, or they've carried Norwich over the line because they haven't been spectacular all season. With Hull, I, 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 they're really struggling to convince me that they can develop that attacking um, consistency to get, you know, to edge those tight games, those tight draws into um, into wins. Despite their attacking quality, to fight, despite their recruitment in January, um, and then for Preston, I feel bad for sort of pushing Preston aside, but. For me, I think it's just they, they had this similar spell this time last season um, and, they, and they dropped off a little bit. They're a spell side. They go through they go through periods of form and then they drop off again. And that might be the case. But if they can carry on and um, you know, pick up a couple of wins straight after the international break, then sure, they deserve to be in a uh, conversation. Cool. Yeah, uh, so for me, pretty similar uh, line of thinking. Like for Norwich, I purely had firepower down as a reason. Like, you know, that's obviously worth its weight in gold at this stage of the season. Coventry, I think the experience of last year getting into the playoffs, I think that will play a huge role as well. And obviously, I agree with Justin. I don't think that the FA Cup semi-final will be a distraction. If anything, it'll add more fuel to the fire. I think, and thinking, yes, we we're good enough. You know, you know we can we can do this. Um, obviously, Hull, 
I think I think their last four results have all been draws. One of them against us, and like like they were very good against us in the first half. But the second half, they just tailed off. I don't know if that was a tactical thing. It was just the fact that then we we stepped up in our intensity. I don't know, but I mean, I'm a massive fan of Liam Rosini. I, I like the job that he's done there. But I think when you when you're comparing them to the other teams, I just think like with their current form and obviously at this stage when you need a lot more like quality and probably a bit more proficiency in front of goal I just don't think that's going to happen for them and for Preston I mean I've been a, I've been a bit of a critic of Preston this season because obviously I've watched them a few times and I, like they are in the nicest way possible they are nothing special but and obviously Ryan Lowe has come under criticism from their fans throughout the season for like you know inconsistent results and performances but you can't knock them for where they currently are like you know it's like it may not be pretty but it's effective and in the championship you know that can sometimes get you in um, but for me I would probably right now lean towards it is going to probably be Norwich or Coventry for that last spot I think Norwich have like Justin touched upon just an incredible attack Josh Sargent has been un- he's pretty much transformed them since he came back yeah. from injury if I could pick one striker to have in the league it would probably be Josh Sargent I don't think Coventry are going to finish in the playoffs this season. I think if we had Sakamoto still fit, we'd probably have an outside chance. We've got a few injuries. And like you say, our squad's quite thin. I think we'll probably finish 7th, 8th, ninth, and then go for the Automax next season. That's the plan. <laughs> um, and I think I agree with you on, on Preston. I think Hull will go close. And I'm, I'm a bit concerned about Hull, what the, the plan is for next season because it seems like they've thrown a lot of eggs into this basket yeah. in terms of loan yeah. players financial signings this season whereas I'm not sure if there's a, a bit of a long term plan with Hull would you agree with that Justin? No it, it, it have I mean Illicali's come out and said you know they wanted to back Rosinia in, in, in January and they did it's just about you know sometimes January recruitment doesn't always go to plan in terms of getting those players settled quickly getting them into that style of play and getting them on board buying into things as, as quick as you know a summer transfer would um, that's why January transfer window is an absolute nightmare to navigate around um, and they recruited heavily uh, the likes of Zeruri and Carvalho for me haven't quite hit the heights I expected them to hit I think Philogene's still been outstanding they've obviously Liam Delap being injured has not helped um, like you said a lot of eggs have gone into that basket and it's just I expected a lot more I think a lot of people expected a lot more especially in a short space of time and that you know, unfortunately those draws could cost them a, a place in the top six as you say leaves them a bit of a rebuild job next season it feels like a bit of a gamble to do it this season as well when the playoffs there's going to be two excellent excellent teams in the playoffs and West Brom you can throw into that as well um, I just think it's quite a gamble for them but it, we might get a Norwich versus Ipswich Ooh. playoff semi-final we might even get a Norwich versus Ipswich playoff final if they completely mm-hmm. capitulate who do you fancy in that one if, if East Anglian <laughs> derby comes to pass in the playoffs again because it did happen under Mick McCarthy yeah. of course yeah I think it's obviously I think the stakes obviously would be a lot higher for both teams if that was the case, you know, whether it be semi-final or a final. But I still think McKenna and that attack of Ipswich, I still think will shine for it. I mean, we've just touched on how good Norwich's Might attack Might finish 8-8 eight, eight on aggregate yeah, or something. Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, it could be, it could, we could actually be in for a very high-scoring tie. And, you know, selfishly, I think that's what a lot of the neutrals would like to see in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, let's t- touch on your team now. We'll head down to the relegation we battle. <laughs> we did do <laughs> we did do a bit of a special last week uh, about the championship teams with a Blackburn fan and a Sheffield Wednesday yeah. fan on as well. But let's talk about Birmingham City because could you ever imagine when you sat down to watch your first game of the season that you'd be on, what is it now, your, your fourth, fifth manager and it would be... Sixth if you count the interims. Your sixth manager yeah. with Gary Rowett in charge, Connor. No, no chance. I, I mean, like back in August, like little giddy, giddy-eyed me would have still <laughs> thought John Eustace would still be in charge and would be comfortably in mid-table. Um, but, you know, that's football. Or if, in this case, it's Birmingham City. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's just... Yeah, it's just it's just same old, same old. You know, you think you think you've turned your corner. You think right, this is the beginning of a new, promising era. Which, in fairness, off the field, that's that's what it is. That's what like it seems to be. But it's just obviously unless unless it synergizes with the on the pitch stuff, it's not really going to be much use. Um, but yeah, obviously, the stuff that happened with Mowbray was so unfortunate, and you know, obviously, I. I think in the end, obviously, with now Rowett coming in and the decision being made, just let him rest and recuperate is absolutely a thing. And so many things come above football. You've got to have you've got to have him, you know, recover. Uh, with Rowett coming in, I am happy with it. Although obviously, you know, it's just 
bonkers because it's just, you know, I never ever would imagine that in August. Um, yeah. Venus seems like a lovely guy, but it was clear quite early on from when he had, was taking charge that he just didn't seem to know what he was doing. Um, and obviously now he's basically been put on gardening leave as well for till the summer period until Mowbray hopefully returns. But obviously Rowett knows the club. He knows exactly. He's, he's been in the situation with us before with eight games to go. So hopefully that can have an impact. But I am still worried because from what I've seen in the last couple of games against Watford and Borough, there were there were teams that the, were there to be attacked and there were points there for for the taking. And yeah, it just... Well, uh, for Borough, it was a lack of effort. Uh, Watford, it wasn't a lack of effort. It was just a massive lack of quality. And obviously, I don't know if either of you scored the Emmanuel Dennis goal that we gifted. <laughs> but it's just... You cannot be in a relegation dogfight and give goals away like that. You just can't. Tom Cleverly masterclass by all accounts, <laughs> I thought. Um, so Birmingham are, are level on points now with, with the relegation zone and Huddersfield just behind them. There's also a lot of teams in the mix and, and Blackburn I wanted to touch upon because they've got the hardest running on paper. Which team are you, you most worried about down there? Is it Blackburn that are they worthy of throwing in the conversation? I don't think so. I mean, they, they've got Samish Modix, who's a top scorer in the league and John Eustace has managed to actually stem the, the flow of goals that were, they were conceding, which is a positive. Obviously something that probably Birmingham needed with joining the Wayne Rooney era, which is uh, really ironic. Um, so I'm not overly worried about Blackburn. I think there's a good formula there of a, a, a match winner in Sammy Schmodix and you know a tighter defence. Um, and obviously Eustace did a similar job last season with, with Birmingham, so you'd expect him to pull them away. The team that I'm most concerned about is Stoke. Their inability to generate a, consistency, a consistent run of results really, really does worry me. Um, they are incredibly wasteful in front of goal. They don't create a boatload of chances anyway. And when you're not taking them, you know, you're know, you opening yourself up to a lot of problems. Um, and as well as that, Stephen Schumacher has really struggled to find a, a consistent blend. Um, they followed up a couple of wins with some really poor defeats. Their defeat against Norwich just before the international break was sort of tools down kind of feel to it. Um, and you'd hope coming out of the international break they do... They do pick up because you know two weeks on the training ground might might help things and hopefully help things, but unfortunately, it's been a trend all season for Stoke. So that's they're, they're the team that worries me. We just feel I'm a little bit worried about because the same problems that were occurring under Darren Moore are now occurring under Andre Brightenwriter. So it's a case of again this two weeks over the international break, vital, absolutely vital. Connor, are you kind of you're in the midst of it all down there? Are you seeing two teams that you think Birmingham are better than and and can finish above this season? So right, right now, I'd say no, because obviously we had a game in hand against Borough, which obviously would have been huge, and it could have eased the worries. Just didn't turn up. Really, really poor performance, probably the worst of the season. And then Watford, it was just a real lack of quality in the final third. And obviously Watford themselves didn't really offer that much. And as I said, they were there for the taking. Obviously, you know, just to just touch on the two weeks, they are massive for all the teams down there. Um, and obviously, Rowett coming back, you think you might get a bit more, you know, a bit more of a pragmatic approach rather than obviously trying to play a bit more expansive as the way that Mowbray obviously wanted to play. Um, but right now, I, I I still think that we are really going to be cutting it fine. And obviously, as Justin said as well, yeah, Stoke are also concerning. But I think it probably is between us, Stoke and Huddersfield, really. I think those are the three that are most concerning right now. I wanted to touch back on Blackburn Rovers. I think I agree with you, Justin, in the fact that Schmodix, he's been so good this season, might win the Golden Boot, and that should be just about enough to keep them up. However, he might also be a very coveted player in the summer, given Blackburn's financial issues. Mm -hmm. What club do you think would suit him, and would it be another move to a championship club if he does move on this summer? It's a difficult one with Schmodix because he's come on massively this season it's a bit of an outlier for him because he's never scored this many goals in one campaign before and he's obviously never played as a striker before he's always been a sort of a number 10 attacking midfielder a bit of a free roaming player but he's, he's becoming an incredible incredible <laughs> goal scorer this season under Blackburn I don't think anybody could have fore, uh, foreseen that but for me it's his ability to press is relentless I think any team who want to play a high press deploy a high press are going to enjoy I mean Samish Modis because his running is brilliant his movement's fantastic as well I think if you're going to link him to a club they're going to have to pay a big wedge of money. So I'd be looking at a team coming down. I mean, a Luton would be perfect, whether or not they'd want to part with, I say Luton, 
no guarantee them coming down from the Premier League, so I won't disrespect them just yet. But um, yeah, any team sort of coming down wanting to play a high press, uh, or any team wanting to play a high press with a bit of money in their pocket, yeah, go for Samish Modric because, as you say, he's, he's become a, a really efficient goal scorer, one of the most consistent this season. Obviously, the most consistent because he's top goal scorer. Where would you value him at the minute in terms of cost? It's difficult because Blackburn are in desperate need of money, aren't they? So maybe they would accept a, a lower offer than. He is worth. Yeah, potentially. I mean, considering uh, Adam Armstrong, I think, went for sort of between 15 million or, so, or something, um, I probably wouldn't go too much higher than that. I mean, Stramonix is around 28, 29 years old, so he's in the peak years of his, his career. I don't know how long he's got left at championship level, because you know, football, footballers' careers can change just like that, you know, very quickly. So, I mean, seven or eight million for a for a player like that would get you, you know, would be a decent offer, especially for a team who are financially struggling. I remember Derby selling Matai Vidra to Burnley for ten million off the back, off the back of his Golden Boot season. Um, you know, sometimes your expectations of income doesn't quite align mm. with the offers coming in. But I think um, yeah, anyone anyone wanting to pay that much money for him will certainly get him because I say one one season in his career where he's done this, yeah, hard to say really. Another team I want to touch on down in the relegation zone is, is Plymouth Argyle and under Ian Foster they've they've really struggled and they've not dragged themselves away from danger. I thought with Schumacher leaving obviously would have an impact, but Schumacher's not improved Stoke at all. <laughs> so it's a bit of a weird club at the minute and their their home form's fallen off a cliff. Yeah, it, it 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 is worrying. I think look I mean what's fortunate for them that right now is they do have a little bit of a cushion still on the teams around them that obviously we've we've touched on already who are struggling to pick up points themselves obviously the the foster thing hasn't quite gone to the way i think the club expected but uh, it's it is strange it is strange obviously the form is concerning but right now i still don't see them in that sort of like pack like fighting for, well you know about dropping into those like you know the relegation spots um but as we touch on with Smodic for Rovers, they have a quality player in Morgan Whitaker who's obviously had an outstanding season himself and obviously in a in a club that isn't as financially backed compared to their rivals at, in Plymouth. It's just his contributions have been absolutely incredible this season. It's just they've been very lucky to have him because obviously for this part of the season where they have struggled, his goals have obviously been pr- like proven to be so, so important. Justin, more or less confident than Connor and uh, Plymouth will stay up this season. I mean, I, obviously, I've already said Stoke are the team that most worries me, but Plymouth are probably up there as well. Um, I think Ian Foster's ability to really reduce that attack to nothing is quite a, quite a good job in terms of a you know, bad way of doing it. Um, it that, you know, Morgan Whitaker, as I'm saying, has been fantastic this season. He's not been as prolific as he has been um, before prior to, to Foster coming in. As I say, I think Finn as leaving in January was a, was a huge blow didn't really replace him either which again is it was, was a big problem I think Plymouth are a good well-run club but sometimes good well-run clubs do make bad decisions I think Ian Foster might come under that category I think like Joe Edwards like Wayne Rooney young managers coming into the championship jobs this season trying to change things because I think Ian Foster's tried to solidify Plymouth but unfortunately that's nullified their best asset which is their attack um, and in, in doing that they're now not in games they're not in scoring uh, much in, in the last few in the last few games as I say to do that to that team is as a neutral, bit of a travesty because you <laughs> love seeing young players play well uh, and perform. And Ian Foster, unfortunately, is uh, yeah, teams dropped off too much. Are you confident they're going to stick with him over this last eight game period, or is there a, a scenario where they press the panic button and, and try and get in a, a more experienced manager? Well, that's yeah, hypothetically, if they lose back to back games over the Easter Easter game period, you know, two games in, in the space of four days, it's a huge, huge um, issue for Plymouth. So. You know, maybe they do press the panic button. I'm not going to speculate, but Neil Warnock lives down in Cornwall, <laughs> so that's an easy one for him to come in and try and fire fight a little bit. If that's the case, he doesn't have to, you know, move, move. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, Aberdeen was a, was a trek for him, but you know, if, if that's the panic button, then you know, yeah, the season really has gone awry. But for me, I think Plymouth will stick with Foster. Connor, I'll put you on the spot here, and you, Justin, Rotherham are clearly down already. I think they could get relegated uh, over the Easter weekend mathematically. Who do you think will go down with them? Which two teams are going down with Rotherham? Uh, I mean, obviously the Rowett thing does give us a fighting chance, but I'm still not convinced in the players to for like this sort of fight. So I still think we will we will go down, and it, it really is a toss up between Stoke and Huddersfield. <laughs> um, yeah, I, th- I think I'll, I think I might go with Stoke because I know Huddersfield like they haven't been great, but they still have picked up the results here and there. So yeah, I think yeah, us and Stoke, I think. I'm going to go with Sheffield Wednesday uh, as the other side. I think it's 
for them to be able to maintain a run of form prior, you know, similar to the one they had a few weeks ago, difficult thing to do. They've had to really pick up the points, had to work really hard to do it. And it's a case of, you know, will will I catch up with them? Six 0 defeat just before the international breakaway Ipswich. Ipswich were magnificent that day, but still, it's a six 0 defeat, and you just sort of that's what gives you a few doubts as to whether or not the, the legs are tiring a little bit and that momentum sort of waning somewhat it doesn't diminish the incredible job Danny Rawls done though because they were by far the worst team I've ever seen at this, mm-hmm. you know, in the championship in my time covering it uh, on the second podcast but for me it'll be Sheffield Wednesday in Stoke I, I just can't see Stoke generating enough consistency like, like Connor was saying Huddersfield have the habit to, to pick up results and know Stoke have won a couple of games here and there but it's just that ability to sustain it and I just don't think Sheffield Wednesday has got the capability to do it between now and the end of the season. Again, it should be a, a very close run in. It could probably go to the final day looking at how close mm. the table is probably. at the minute. We're going to go to our early awards I've labelled this section of the season and we'll start with manager of the season for you and, and I think it's worth mentioning in that relegation discussion, none of us mentioned QPR which means Sif Wentes is surely got to be up there as, as manager of the season, Justin. Certainly if he keeps QPR up, he's, he deserves to be in the, the conversation because, again, QPR... I mean, we had a really bad pick of teams down at the bottom of the table. Rotherham have been dreadful. Sheffield Wednesday for Isco Munoz's spell were by far one of the worst teams to play at championship level. And again, QPR under Gareth Ainsworth were dreadful. Um, so for Royal and Sif Wentes to come in and pick Wednesday and QPR up uh, the way they have done is, is remarkable. QPR, I think, are the ninth. Um, they've accumulated the ninth most points since the turn of the year, which again, with the, the budget constraints, the, um, the, the uh, ownership, well, ownership problems, but as, yeah, financially they, they don't really recoup much and they've had to buy a lot of, or, or bring in a lot of experienced players. Um, he's, he's done a really good job with pennies, basically. Um, but as you say, I think if you are going to point the finger at a manager of the season, tend to do it towards the, the promotion contenders, but it's certainly relegation down at the bottom, Sif Fuentes and, and, and Real do deserve a yeah. fair few I'd just, I'd just say as well, it says a lot as well, with the conversations that we've just had about the teams we're worried about and QPR wasn't mentioned once, so obviously that goes in his favour. It's because the last few weeks as well, like that they even if results haven't been coming, they have been playing well and I'd say they are they have been a better footballing side than the teams around them. So yeah, I think for the impact he has had there is definitely definitely having him up there in the conversation like as Justin says if they do st- stay up which I think they have a very good chance of doing I think there's a big East Anglian elephant in the uh, corner for this conversation though isn't there and it's, it's not Norwich and David Wagner um, Kieran McKenna at Ipswich even if they don't get promoted if they finish third with this huge points total as a newly promoted side surely McKenna's manager of the season yeah I think what what really does skew the season is the fact that the parachute payment teams that have come down have got squads that are just ridiculous so they have to they have to perform well and if they don't I mean someone's really done a bad job so it's really hard to you know, convince yourself that Daniel Fark has done the best job in the division despite if, you know, if Leeds go up as title winners then yeah he has done the best job in the division but actually for Kieran McKenna to compete with Ipswich, Leicester and Southampton with their financial disparity between those teams is ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous and it, it's a lot of those players were recruited while the team were in League One. Connor Chaplin, Lackey, Luke Wolfman's come through the ranks. You know, a lot of Sam Morsey, etc. Massimo Longo. Yeah, you know, the list can go on. Um, so for 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 Ripswich to keep pace with them and potentially better one of uh, two of those three sides is, is remarkable. So yeah, if even if Ipswich do finish in the in the playoffs, you have to you have to give it McKenna. But then again, I think if Sifa uh, does just keep QPR comfortably, or Danny Royal pulls us. Pulls Wednesday out of the bottom three, or maybe I just one of those two. There's a there's another coach as well at the top of, towards the top of the table that I throw into the conversation. I don't think he'd scoop the top award, but I think he deserves a lot of credit for the job he's done, and that's Corberan. Uh, because obviously West Brom, obviously they've got a takeover now, which has gone through, which is obviously good for them, and you know offers them like a, a promising new future. But before there was so much uncertainty off the pitch, and obviously I, I know too well about that kind of uncertainty um, obviously they, I think they had they were the only club in this season that hadn't spent a penny on a permanent player and obviously West Brom from the last couple of years they had assembled like a you know a, a solid championship squad but still for him to have them that competitive at that end of the table despite other teams around them strengthening I think it kind of has gone under the radar just how well he's done it's you know Obviously, the work he did at Huddersfield a couple of years ago was far greater because obviously it was like so much more unexpected. But 
he st- it still shows that he's just a great manager at this level. I think if you're Southampton or whoever finishes fourth in the championship, you are seriously worried about playing West Brom over two yeah, legs in the yeah. playoffs because they're so good at defending. I think they'll be so difficult to beat in the playoffs. Right, let's move on to our Player of the Season award. Obviously, there's a few names to throw in the mix, but Connor, I'll, I'll let you start. Yeah, uh, so this this is a player that I've, I've already mentioned and I'm, I am leaning towards it because of obviously how important their contributions to that particular team have been. And I'm going to go with Morgan Whitaker. I think for a million pounds signing, I think you can't have asked for anything more than what he's given to Plymouth so far this season. Because, uh, you know, you have... Like, you know, you have your Sammy Schmodix who's also doing an incredible job in a team that's like limited compared to the likes of, say, your Dewsbury Halls and Adam Armstrong, who are surrounded by very, very good operators at this level. But for Morgan, Morgan Whisker to rack up, like, you know, 18 goals, seven assists, you know, in a in a team that they weren't necessarily like favoured to go down, but were probably given, accepted to struggle a little bit in the promotion to the championship. I just think for what he has done this season, for for a t- for a team like that, I just think you just cannot ignore it at all. I think it's absolutely exceptional. If he can find his scoring boots and, and keep them in the division, he's definitely in the conversation. Uh, Justin, any? Uh, yeah, I've got two players in mind actually. I mean, the, the one I want to bring in conversation is Gabriel Sara at Norwich because although he has got a little bit more quality around him than like Morgan Whitaker, um, I think to get over twenty goal contributions from midfield in that Norwich team without Josh Sargent for large portions mm-hmm. of the season, that's quite quite an incredible job. And as well, you know. David Wagner has got Norwich into the playoffs, but there were times where Norwich were incredibly stifled from an attacking point of view. They were really bland and boring to watch. It was a ham sandwich. It wasn't very fun um, for the Norwich supporters, and you know, that's why there was a lot of David Wagner out shouts. Um, so Gabriel Osara, for two-thirds of the season, has carried that Norwich team to do that and to get them into the playoff contention, I think is is a brilliant job. But I think if you're going to if you're going to throw the um, player of the season at anyone, it's got to be Sami Schmodix, because again, he's, he's playing in a team where haven't been great for all season. There's been you know, a lot of uh, ownership problems they've had. Um, they had a lot of injury problems as well, and he's 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 really had to carry that team. So if, without those goals, you know, stepping into Ben Brown's Diaz's boots, um, as, uh, so to speak, um, for him to do that and, and to be a consistent goal scorer, I think yeah, he deserves to deserves to be in contention for the the season. I think the teams at the top obviously have top players, but with the likes of Leeds and Ipswich, I think they're more of a collective attacking unit without one particular standout. I think Ampadu's been superb at Leeds from a defensive point of view. Leif Davis, obviously, at Ipswich. And then Dewsbury Hall's probably over the course of the season been the best player, but he's playing for probably the best team. So there's a whole array of options, but I, I like the shouts of an individual who's potentially kept the team up yeah. with their goals um, got a question for you both now about English players and obviously Gareth Southgate gets criticised every single minute he's England, England manager for his selections but if you could pick one championship player currently in the championship this season to drop into England's Euro 2024 squad who would you pick now it's unlikely to be an attacking player if we're honest given England's huge array of options so Con- Connor do you want to throw a name in? Well, well we were talking about this earlier weren't we and um and I was surprised because I just, you know, you just hear the name and you just assume Welsh. But for me, it would be, it, it, I think it has to be Leif Davis, especially with the current options at left back that England have. I mean, Chilwell with one knee and Luke Shaw <laughs> with the other one, I think yeah, it is, isn't it? I know, honestly, I think, yeah, after, after the poor performance on uh, the other night, I think Chilwell's spot is very much up for grabs. But <laughs> anyone who can kick a ball, basically, uh, very poor. And obviously for... Davis is like contributions like the assists. I think it's like fourteen he's racked up in the championship this season. It's, you know, it's so vital now, especially in the modern game of football. Where obviously, like, you know, you expect a lot of attacking output as well as defensive from your fullbacks, and Davis does give you that. So I think, like, for me, I think that's a pretty much standout. Justin, yeah, I've got two shots. A sensible one and then a bit of a fun one. Uh, a sensible one, I'd go for Kieran Dewsbury Hall. I think that midfield uh, under Gareth Southgate is crying out for a ball carrier. So Kenny Dewsbury Hall fills that, fills that void quite you know, significantly. And I think if he was playing in the Premier League this season, more than likely would be in contention because, as I say, central midfield options are quite limited. In terms of fun, I think the England team's incredibly boring, so I'd recall Jamie Vardy within a heartbeat. <laughs> like, not only for penalties, not only for the, the media in between games. Uh, he's 37 and still scoring goals. Um, but also just the general S. that he gets on with. Like If he scores against a, 
an away team, he gives it back, doesn't he? And you mm. need that in that England team because I think it lacks a little bit of personality again. Yeah. <laughs> I'd only want Vardy and if we then appoint Rooney as manager oh just God. so they can have a, a Barney on the touchline. <laughs> yeah. My shout for this one, by the way, is the area which I think England are in real trouble in, which is defensive midfield. If Declan Rice gets injured, we are screwed. So my pick, and I've seen him all the season, is obviously Ben Sheaf because I've not seen a player more ready to play in the Premier League. We saw it against Wolves. He was the best midfielder on the pitch. He's physical, he's strong, he's got a decent eye for goal. And I think if you look at where England are lacking, defensive midfield, left back, centre back, those are the areas we really need to address. So I'll go for, for Ben Chief. Justin, I don't know if you've only got no, any thoughts on, on no, Chief. I do agree. He's, he's um, again, a bit like Robbins, really, a bit like Coventry, just gone on the radar. He's, he's destined to play in the Premier League. I know he's 26 now, so he's, he's probably at the wrong end of his career, being a, 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 a not a prodigy, but a, a young player coming up through, through the ranks. But he, he deserves a shout. He's a great ball winning player. Airs of Declan Rice a little bit, actually, because again, he's, he's got a ball carrying ability as well. He can, he can spray a pass. Um, although it's not, not, not his main responsibility. But for me, yeah, he deserves to... Um, again, he probably, if he was playing in the Premier League, he would be in contention. Um, you know, If he can replicate mm -hmm. you know, a semblance of the form that he's been showing in the Championship, then I think he would be would be in a conversation. But yeah, certainly, certainly a good shout. Yeah. He would certainly be in my Championship team of the season so far. And that's what we're going to try and put together quickly here. Um, to get this going, I'm going to give you three ace cards each where you can throw three names straight into the team. We don't have to discuss them. And we'll try and build a bit of a team around that. Let's try and do a 4-3-3 three, three maybe. Um, Justin, let's, let's start with you. We've obviously mentioned a few players yeah. in contention for player of the year. Go for Ooh, it. I mean, Samish Modic's got to be in there. I'm going to try and write these down yeah, so yeah. we make sure we only have 11 <laughs> players in there and we don't avoid. Yeah, end up with a match day squad. I go Samish Modic. Um, he's he's got to be in there. Gabriel Sara. Uh, is another that I've mentioned uh, heavily biased towards them because I've already picked them from a player of the season um, I'll go with the goalkeepers or Alex Palmer at West Brom just clean sheets good set, you know, a good shot stopper as well and a player who I think West Brom missed quite significantly last season Connor please don't say Jay Stansfield or a Birmingham player <laughs> <laughs> you sure no, I no. quite like Jay Stansfield but no, yeah, <laughs> no. well, yeah, one of the few players that does come out with a bit of credit this year um, but no um for me, Kyle Walker-Peters at right back, I think it has to be. Um, and then sticking in defence as well, I think Vestergaard for Leicester. I think his kind of renaissance at Leicester, given how much he was hated when he first joined and wasn't performing, like now he's like so important to the way they play. And he's really turned around his career there. I think he's probably been one of the best defenders in the division. And I think if I was then to go for a striker, I think it has to be Adam Armstrong because not only has he scored an abundance of goals, he's also assisted a lot of them too. And, you know, it, it's, it's amazing really just because of, you know, his physique, he's not the biggest, but he's still such a handful to deal with. Such a good championship goal scorer. We saw that at Blackburn as well, right? So we need a centre-back and a left-back. The left-back's obvious, isn't it, Leif Davis? Yes, Leif Davis, yeah. Um, and Connor, do you want to start with a centre-back suggestion potentially? Another one. We could have Ampadu. I was going to say if we want the ver if we want the versatile aspect, yeah, Ampadu because like you know even though like you know he's brilliant in midfield, he's also shown that he's brilliant in defence as well. Like you know he's he hasn't been phased by that switch of position as well. So yeah, he's more than willing to go into that spot. Any other centre back options you want to throw in? Uh, there? I mean, Joe Rodon's a, a good shout as well. Um, it could be either one of those two because they've been magnificent. Both Ampadu's shown it in midfield and defence this season. It just shows goes to show how good he is. As an individual, I think um, Mark Faust as well is uh, again another shout mm. with Leicester because it's why he just carries the ball out. It's ridiculous, um, and he really does get Leicester going. Um, I think in terms of centre halves, trying to think now on my feet, uh, poor, uh, Bobby, uh, not Bobby Collins, um, Collins at Coventry. Completely forgot his name. Then not Collins. Brad Collins. But, no, the, Brad Bobby Collins. Thomas. Bobby, Bobby Thomas. Thomas. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting, getting, I'm getting a million names. Yeah. Paul, right now, yeah. Bobby Thomas, I think, is yeah, he's really stepped into things. Um, he's been you know, fairly consistent for Coventry, and he's had to fill some big boots as well because there's not a lot of experience in that back line um, at Coventry. I'll tell you what we can do. We can either have Ampadu. It, Ampadu's going in the team, so he can either play in midfield. It's him or Sheaf. So it's Sheaf or Rodon. Okay, have we completely overlooked Dewsbury Hall as well? He, he, we'll fit him in, don't worry. <laughs> if we need to. Let's, let's worry about that that's, later. That's, don't that's confuse me. <laughs> so Sheaf or Road on us. Let's, let's pick one there. We'll go Sheaf. We'll get yeah. Sheaf in there. Right, so Ampadu at the back. So we've got some wide positions to fill here. We can have... I'm putting Gabriel Sara back a bit in midfield with Sheaf. Schmodek's behind Armstrong. So the wide positions, 
we can chuck Tuchby all in there as well if we need <laughs> to. Uh, Justin, wingers, wide forwards, strikers you can chuck out on the wing that have impressed you this season. I mean, we've not really had any strikers that have impressed consistently other than Josh Sargent and Samish Modic, to be honest with you. Uh, Adam Armstrong's been playing wide for Southampton. Uh, we've just been blessed with good wide attacking players. We've got Jack Clark, Jaden Philogene, Chris Entio Somerville. There's an abundance of players that can be in, on this list. I think Somerville's got to be on there because, again, just the amount of goals he scored um, and just how, I wouldn't say he's got leads out of trouble, but those tight games where leads have struggled, he has been a difference, which, again, those games do make up being in top spot and being in the playoffs. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly Somerville. I mean, Connor Chapin is a shout-out as well. Nathan Broadhead, although not a consistent starter, has been has been really good for Ipswich as well. Somerville's in the same, no debate, on the mm. left. So we just need to fill either a striker position or the, the right wing position obviously Morgan Whittaker's not in this team yet yeah it, it, it is tough because obviously you know I've, I've already mentioned Whittaker as like my contender for player of the season but at the same time I think there's another player who isn't who hasn't played as a striker himself but he's also been very vital to the way his team have played this season that's Ruter at Leeds I think given the the hype or the pressure that surrounded him when he arrived at Elland Road. I think it was a thirty million pound player, and obviously, in the second half of the Premier League season, like he just looked like he wasn't a thirty pound player. But this year, like he's just he seems to have settled, and he's become a very, very, very good player for them. And whether or not that's just like him developing at his own pace, or it's like the having someone like Farker experience, like you know, giving him the guidance that he needs, and he's been so important to Leeds, but. Obviously, if he's not a strike. You know, he's been playing as the ten in behind. So it we is. can put Armstrong up front. I'm not worried about the striker yeah. position. I think we've got Somerville, so let's leave Ruter out. As harsh as that is, um, I'm happy to go with Whitaker unless there's any yeah, other options. Uh, yeah, I think I think Whitaker yeah, or Chaplin. If, yeah, about that. I mean, the Jack Clark as well. And oh, yeah, <laughs> it's, a flip, it's a flip. Of the Should coin. we do a squad? <laughs> <laughs> it's a flip of the coin with them. It's a flip, you can have any one of them, and no one's going to. Bite your head off. Uh, Whitaker's going in. Yeah. Then. Let's put Whitaker in because yeah. Connor likes him for player of the season. So our championship team of the season so far is Palmer, Walker Peters, Vestergaard, Ampadu, Davis, Sheaf and Sara, Whitaker, Schmodix, Somerville, Armstrong. We've done a pretty good job there, I think, haven't That's we? So that was our championship special. Thank you very much for joining me, Justin and Connor. I hope your seasons end with promotion and not relegation for you, <laughs> Connor. You'd say that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, guys. We'll see you next time on the Sportsman Untitled. <laughs>